Hi Year 12, this is the video for Around the World in 80 Dates. Oh, I'm so sorry. Massive yawn right at the start of the video. That's not good, is it? Uh, yeah, Around the World in 80 Dates. So this is the last uh, memoir text that we're going to get a chance to cover uh, before the summer. Uh, it's a short one um, and it has some similarities to uh, the one that we did last, which was Understanding Chic. Um, but it is quite different. So um, again, if you haven't read this text recently, pause the video, read it, it should only take you a couple minutes, and then unpause to read the contextualisation. So the contextualisation is on page six, and it tells us that uh, Jennifer Cox is a British TV presenter and travel writer. Around the World in 80 Dates is an account of how she left her job as a head of public relations for Lonely Planet and travelled around the world in search of a soulmate. So um, that tells us all our contextual information. Again, might be a good idea to pause the video here and to fill this in yourself, just to make sure that you uh, can do that confidently and then unpause uh, to check the answers. If you're not sure, um, then just leave the video unpaused and do it with me. So this is a memoir slash a travel log basically um, a little bit like Bill Bryson, kind of writing as you're travelling. Uh, the text producer is Jennifer Cox and we know that she is a writer. Uh, text receiver are going to be uh, people that um, again know her writing um, as, uh, as she, she was a writer. Uh, so her fans or people interested in um, perhaps like doing a similar thing to her so other people that are also searching for love may be interested in this so uh, calling them lonely hearts seems a bit bleak but it's the first thing that comes to mind people interested in the topic really uh, the register is I'd say medium almost to low it's very conversational in parts, but just bear in mind it's not a conversation, so it's not it's not totally low register, but it does mimic some conversational features. Uh, her purpose is uh, fairly entertaining. She writes more like Bill Bryson than she does uh, Natasha Fraser Cavassoni from Understanding Chic. So it's to entertain um, and it's also to describe. And the mode is written. Uh, but it does have some conversational features in, um, as I was saying a second ago. So, um, this is a very, uh, kind of, uh, it's very different from Understanding Chic in the sense that it's focused on one memory very specifically, and it's the memory of her going to um, the Pierre Lachaise Cemetery in Paris to visit the grave of one of her idols, so the Doors singer Jim Morrison. So it's centrally located in one setting, so we don't get the same prolepsis. Oh, you're 12, apologies. This is what I get for making a recording at half eight at night. Goodness me, I should be in my bed. Um, so we don't get the same prolepsis and analepsis as we do with Understanding Chic. She's not jumping around different time periods. She's, she's settled on one. And um, her writing is, because she has... Uh, spent time as a journalist her writing is quite um rhetorical she has lots of rhetorical features um it's quite conversational and chatty almost quite hyperbolic in places so that's kind of mainly what i'm going to be looking at and as it's a short text i don't think you're going to have a huge amount of additional annotation to make afterwards so she starts by kind of talking about her fascination with Jim Morrison, whose grave she's gone to see. And um, she uses some wordplay right at the start, which she picks up once or twice throughout the rest of the text. And this tells us about kind of her purpose. So she describes, she's saying that Jim Morrison's a little bit like Elvis Presley. And she says, as the lizard king became the lard king. And she uses this wordplay to make the audience laugh. So I'm going to link that to 
her purpose of entertaining. So, Lizard King is a name that was given to Jim Morrison, Lard King. Um, she's making that joke because Elvis Presley got a lot put on a lot of weight as he got older. It was kind of one of the reasons that uh, he died. He was very unfit. Uh, she's making a joke there about um, the, the kind of differences between Elvis and um, and Jim Morrison. So she's trying to be funny. She's trying to entertain her audience. And in terms of the representation of anything Parisian, we don't really get that in here. Unt uh, well, unless really you look just further on, as the Lizard King became the Lord King and tired of himself, maybe that's what drew him there. So it's saying that e e erotic and playful as he, Paris, was also cultured and subtle. So it suggests that Paris draws people towards it. Um, people that were kind of searching for something. So as Jim Morrison became older and became a bit more like Elvis, put on the weight and wasn't really sure of himself anymore, he was drawn to Paris. So you have to look on a bit for the AO4. Paris is presented as a little bit of a sanctuary for people. Somewhere that people can find themselves. Maybe somewhere that people go later in life when they when they're kind of past their best and they're looking maybe for a bit of peace but i'm primarily thinking about that kind of setting up the word play and, and that purpose of entertaining and i think you could pair uh this quote here so increasingly trying to look whenever i find a quote at something that i can support it with to make a stronger point Although it's not wordplay, I think you get the purpose of entertaining coming through in some of the hyperbole um, that she uses. So, for example, I, expe I suspect that as a boyfriend, Jim Morrison would have been an absolute nightmare, unfaithful, self-indulgent and often cruel. So that triplet there, unfaithful, self-indulgent and cruel, I think that is, that triplet is becoming quite hyperbolic. Um, I'm going to link that in to that purpose of entertaining up here. I think that that's what she's trying to do there as well. Um, and I, I also, I'm going to link that into her, um, the kind of text producer, the fact that she is a writer and she does use these rhetorical techniques quite a lot. The type of rhetorical techniques you're likely to see in a piece of journalism. So I'm going to link that to text producer being a journalist at one point. Okay. And um, I'm now looking down at uh, down uh, here where she starts to talk about the cemetery itself rather than uh, Jim Morrison specifically. And she uses another example of wordplay which you could link in there. Fashionable dress for the afterlife. Uh, is that right? Yes. Um, has been a fashionable dress for the afterlife since its inception. So she's playing on words there. Fashionable dress for the afterlife. Because obviously the concept of having an address when you're dead is, is redundant. So she's playing on the, the idea of the address. So that word play, you could link up and support that point with it as well. Okay, I'm now going to look down a little bit further where she has some description of what the cemetery is like. So down here, around line kind of 28, she says, Perlichez still had all the winding avenues and tree-lined boulevards from the days where people lived rather than died here, and it was easy to get lost. So that description of winding avenues and tree-lined boulevards. I'm going to link that noun phrase. 
to another purpose of her text, which is to describe her surroundings. So the purpose of describing rather than uh, entertaining. So her writer, her readers rather get a kind of strong visual sense of what it was like to be there. And uh, Paris comes across there as kind of fairly beautiful, the concept of a winding avenue with lots of trees makes it sound very picturesque. So Paris as a very beautiful city is a nice kind of straightforward representation of Paris there. Okay, so moving on. On this second page, she starts, she uh, kind of moves her narrative now onto the other people in the cemetery. Um, and what she does, uh, I'm going to pick up some examples from this page and the next page, is to do with the structure. So she often begins her paragraphs um, by uh, describing the people that uh, she's going to be talking about within that paragraph that were at the, the grave. So for example, three 19 year old boys is here. On the back page, so this, this kind of annotation is going to be spread out a little bit. You then get a Midwestern couple and a woman in her 20s. So I'm going to make the note here because these two examples are closer together. But this, just make a note, is building into the same point. There we go. So we know that's all together. So the, the same thing is being used um, and it's a kind of uh, noun phrase that acts as a discourse marker to describe the topic of that paragraph. So these are noun phrases as discourse markers and they are being used to kind of show thematically what that what that paragraph is going to be. So uh, it's being used in a level six way. Uh, as discourse, sorry, that should say markers, not marks, discourse markers there. And what is this saying in terms of the representation of the city? Well, it suggests that it's quite a diverse place for people to visit because you've got people from the Midwest of the um, United States, you've got young people, you've got, on the other page, 19-year-old boys, you've got teenagers. So it suggests that Paris is a diverse city and it attracts lots of different people. That's my representation of Paris. And in terms of my AO3, um, I'm going to be saying, I'm going to link this into the genre. So I'm going to say that, oops, here we go. So as she's writing uh, a memoir, it's going to be uh, like Understanding Chic. It's going to be kind of snapshots of um, memories or moments that are most significant. So what she's doing here is, there were probably other people there, but she has picked out the people from that day that she's got the most to say about. So it's something that reflects the genre. Because you've got the kind of like snapshots of the most significant memories. Or significant or, or important. And these little discourse markers help to say, well, I I saw this person and I had something to say about them and I remember this other person and they're worth telling you about because. Okay, um, so I'm going to pick out one more thing and then I would suggest that you maybe add in an additional one or two annotations. Um, but it's quite a short text, so that shouldn't take you too long. Now, I'm going to look right at the end and I'm going to look at this kind of uh, penultimate paragraph as well as this one here. So um, she starts to kind of question herself at the end about what was she trying to achieve when she went to this graveyard uh, to think about this, this person that she used to fancy when she was younger. 
um, and she becomes quite reflective. There are a lot of rhetorical questions you can see there. As I read the dedications, I wondered why I and all these other people nurture the search and during love for Jim Morrison. By choosing Morrison, we're reclaiming some part of his creative sexual vitality as her own by liking him, blah, blah, blah. Or could it simply be blah, blah, blah? So she uses four. Just find them here. One, two, three, four. So she uses four rhetorical questions. And what she's doing by by ending this extract in this way is showing that the travelling that she's doing, so she's travelling around the world and she's, she's talking about 80 dates and, and this is a kind of a date with Jim Morrison, that she's going on a physical journey around the world, but she's also going on like an emotional or a kind of spiritual journey. And all these questions at the end show that part of the purpose of what she's doing in this text is to kind of reflect on uh, her life and reflect on her search for love. So I'm going to link this into the purpose of kind of reflecting. And also how this physical journey is also an emotional journey. And I think that that is part of the genre of a travel log. So we said this is kind of part memoir, part travel log. And the idea of travelling around and recording what is happening to you is often, you know, you reflect on what you're kind of feeling as you go through and what you're learning. So I link that to that kind of secondary genre of a, of a travel log. And how is this presenting kind of Paris and um, Parisians? It kind of does so inadvertently. So the fact that Jim Morrison is buried in Paris, we kind of have to take the representation of Jim Morrison as part of the representation of Paris because it's not being explicit about Paris here. So. Um, somewhere that important people and important memories happen is how I'm going to interpret the representation of Paris here because as I say it's not explicit. So Paris is a kind of uh, a place of importance that uh, attracts a, a variety of people. Okay, so you have got probably one or two additional annotations to make. Certainly one over on this page, down here, and perhaps one further up because this annotation is linked to the other page. Um, oh, I just looked at my camera and I can see that it's slightly off. I really hope that it was visible for you in the annotations. Um, hopefully you could see the majority of them sorry I didn't realise as I was writing that it had slipped slightly um, if you're having any difficulties with this annotation because of the, the way the camera is just message me and I can um, photograph my annotations but hopefully you could hear what I was saying and, and therefore pick it up okay that is the end of the video and um, I think you probably need to spend maximum about 20 minutes adding to this. Alright, thanks, bye!